Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And good Yom Tif. The nice thing about Yom Kippur beginning on a Friday is you have the Shabbat Shalom greeting that we're all used to. Uh, but any other day that it occurs, uh, we simply use good Yom Tif, which is a wish for a good uh, holy day. And we welcome you to a Donalam Messianic congregation and our Yom Kippur Kol Nidre service. Um, this is our second service that we are holding in this building. And so we are still adjusting on the fly a little bit, uh, searching for things that uh, made the move, but where they ended up, we're not exactly sure. Uh, but we just trust um, that this service uh, will be a blessing to you. My name is Todd Lesser. I'm the congregational leader, uh, and I will be also uh, also be assisted by Randall Anderson uh, later uh, in leading the service. We are here first and foremost to lift up and proclaim Messiah Yeshua. Uh, we will use Hebrew in the service because we emphasize the Jewishness of the Messiah and the Jewishness of our new covenant faith. We will usually provide the English translation uh, because we want everyone to know and understand what we are saying or singing. We see ourselves as a community, the one new man that Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, uh, talked about in Ephesians chapter 2 when he described Jew and Gentile coming together as one. Uh, <clears throat> since our service is a little different than our regular Shabbat service, you can uh, use the PowerPoint to guide you uh, this week. At last week we had one screen. This week we have two screens. Um, <clears throat> two screens. <clears throat> so you should have no difficulty seeing them. Uh, the parts that you will say will be generally in all white. Uh, the leader's parts will be in yellow. Uh, you're welcome to say those softly to yourself if you would like. We are also in the final day of the traditional 40-day season of Teshuvah, uh, which means repentance uh, or returning to God. And so we will sound the shofar this evening as a, for the final time of this season as a call to look within, a call to introspection, uh, as well as a call to assembly. So at this time, I'm going to call up Jeremy Previtz to sound the blast on the shofar for us this evening. student. I taught him how to do it. That'll get a laugh as long as I'm able to use it. Okay. Also, I'll point out that uh, many of us are dressed in white this evening, which is symbolic of an inner cleansing that it is supposed to represent. However, uh, it came as a surprise to me when I came to my very first Yom Kippur service Kol Nidre service at the Don Alum Messianic Congregation. Even though I was one of the few people at the service, if not the only one, uh, who was raised Jewish, who uh, my mother and father were both Jewish. Now I gotta admit, I didn't attend High Holy Day services, uh, or our family didn't, I went one time. But, um, <clears throat> so I did not keep up with the traditions, but I was also a leader in a large Messianic congregation in Atlanta, and we did not practice that tradition. So. Uh, if you're dressed differently, the most important thing is the cleansing on the inside. Hopefully, whatever we're wearing on the outside is just a, a reflection of that. This service is called the Kol Nidre service. Kol Nidre is an ancient chant that was traditionally used as a remedy for those Jewish people who were coerced into making vows or promises. It was also used by Jewish people who were forced to convert from Judaism to Roman Catholicism during the time of the Spanish Inquisition. We will now listen to the Kol Nidre chanted by Marty Getz. Yeah. 
in the Sabbath and the Holy Day with the traditional lighting of the Sabbath and Holy Day candles. We say traditional in that the candles are lit at this time. We actually say uh, a messianic uh, candle blessing. Thank you, May. And now I'm going to call up our cantor, Fred Scott, uh, as we will be, he will be chanting the Shehekianu blessing as we thank the Lord for bringing us to this season. And let us recite together the English translation. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life and sustained us and enabled us to reach this season. Amen. Now I would ask everyone to please stand for the bar food. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Bless 
the Lord, who is blessed forever and ever. Now we will be chanting the Shema. The Shema is based on Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And in this prayer, once again, as a community, we affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then recite the English translation, followed by the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6, together the Shema. Shema Yisrael by these recent storms as well as uh, our people in Israel fighting uh, terrorism on uh, two fronts uh, with the ground war taking place uh, on both of those fronts. Eloheinu velohavo tenu Elohavraham Elohei Yitzchak Elohei Yaakov Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just thank you as we come before uh, you this evening, Lord, and we ask you to bless this service and all that we do. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you have provided the way of atonement uh, through the sacrifice of your son, Messiah Yeshua. You have provided the way of reconciliation and restoration with the creator of the universe. Lord, we thank you uh, that, that we are able to be restored, that we are able to have our sins forgiven. But Lord, we also think about what is going on in our world today. And we pray for those, particularly in Western North Carolina, even though we had it, many had it bad here, uh, Lord, it, it has been much worse there. And so we pray uh, for their continued restoration and recovery. And Lord, we pray that through these events, uh, there would be an openness to see your hand at work, a, a openness to see the revelation of Messiah Yeshua. We pray for those in Florida who have been impacted by two storms uh, going through in many areas. And Lord, we just uh, pray your comfort upon those who have experienced uh, loss. And, and for our people, Israel, Lord, uh, we pray that many of our people would be open uh, to the revelation of Messiah through these events. But Lord, you would comfort those who are suffering loss, that you would bless your people who are dwelling in the land that you have given to them. And, Lord, that you would give them victory over their enemies, those who seek uh, not only their land, but even their uh, uh, removal from this world, uh, their elimination, Lord. But we know that your faithfulness is being tested, and you are more powerful than any force in this world. Lord, you are even able to perform the miracle that it may take to bring the rest of the hostages uh, home safely. So, Lord... Uh, we dedicate all that we do this evening in this service to you. And we ask these things. Uh, Lord, we ask your anointing on this service, on the uh, singing and the praise and the worship and the uh, liturgy and, and the, the words in the message that, uh, Lord, you have just 
uh, brought concerning the events of this day, your reason for establishing this day. And so, Lord, uh, we just desire for your will to be done, that you might receive all the glory, honor, and praise. We ask it in our Messiah, Yeshua's name. Amen. You may be seated, and now I'm going to call up Janiel Scott to make our announcements for this week. Good Yontif, and Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to Adon Olam Messianic Congregation. If you're a first-time visitor, please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. If you've not yet received a visitor's packet, please keep your hand raised so that we can get one to you. The packet contains brochures which tell you about our congregation and our services. You will also find a visitor's card which we would ask you to kindly fill out and place in the offering box next to the American flag after the service. Once again, we are blessed to have you with us this evening. Tomorrow at 4 p.m., we will wear normal colored clothes as we conclude our observance of Yom Kippur with a community break the fast and cover dish dinner afterward. This Sunday at 10 a.m., we'll be putting up our sukkah so that we can hold our Sukkot or Feast of Tabernacles service on the, in the sukkah next Wednesday evening at 7.30 p.m. on the first night of Sukkot, weather permitting. <laughs> Feel free to trim branches in your yard and you can bring them to put on our sukkah anytime from Sunday to Wednesday. Our Tuesday class on the Book of Romans is suspended until after Sukkot. Next Friday, we'll have our regular Friday evening Sabbath service here in the sanctuary. And one week from this Sunday, starting at noon, we'll have our annual Sukkot picnic. Please bring a main dish to grill, to cook on a grill for yourself and your family, along with a side dish to share. And now we pray the Lord's blessings upon you and hope that you will feel his sweet spirit as you worship with us. Once again, good yontif and Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Janiel. Last year we broke the fast with a plan to break the fast with a snack, and a lot of you brought lots more food. So instead of trying to fight that uh, wave of uh, wanting to fatten all of us up, uh, we just decided to go with the flow. So um, <clears throat> whatever you are comfortable bringing tomorrow, and uh, if your observance causes you to not want to bring any food at all, that's all right as well. And now we will recite together Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the mountain of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not taken my name in vain, and hath not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of them that seek after him, that seek thy face, even Jacob, Salah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Yea, lift them up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who then is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory, Salah. You may be seated. Magnified and hallowed be the great name of our God. Blessed, praised, glorified, honored, and exalted be the name of the King of kings, the Holy One. Blessed be he who is the first and the last, and besides him there is no God. Extol him in the heavens, Lord is his name. Rejoice in his presence, 
His name is more exalted than all blessing and praise. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Let the name of the Lord be blessed forever and ever. Now I would ask you to join with me in reciting He Being Merciful. He being merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Now I'm going to call up our cantor to chant the Avinu Malkadi. Avinu Malkadi. Avinu <laughs> Avinu makenu, avinu makenu, chanenu vanenu, ke'en barama asim. Asay imadu, tzedaka v'chesed, asay imadu, tzedaka v'chesed, v'hoshiyenu. Together the translation. Our Father, our King, be gracious to us and answer us. Though we have no merits, show us charity and loving kindness and save us. I will now call up Jeremy Keelan uh, to open the ark, and we would ask that when the ark is opened, you would please stand for the Kedusha, which means uh, sanctification. I'm also going to call up Randall Anderson, who will be leading this part of the service. sanctify your name in the world as we sanctify it in the highest heavens as it is written by your prophet they shall call to each other and say Kadosh 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 Adonai Zavod Together. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Those across from them say, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. And in the Holy Scriptures it is written, The Lord will reign forever. Thy God, O Zion, to all generations. In every generation we will tell of your greatness, and in every age we will proclaim your holiness. Your praise will certainly never depart from our lips, for you are a great and holy God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord, the holy God. When the ark is closed, y'all may be seated.
our God and God of our fathers, our God and God of our fathers, pardon our iniquities on this atonement day. Blot out our sins and transgressions and make them pass away from before thine eyes. As it is written in the scriptures, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for mine own sake and I will, remit, I will not remember your sins. I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud, and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Our God and God of our fathers, Sanctify us by thy commandments and grant that our, that our portion be in thy Torah. Satisfy us with thy goodness and gladden us with thy salvation. Together, purify our hearts to serve thee in truth. For thou art the forgiver of Israel, thy people. In every generation, and besides thee, we have no king who pardons and forgives. Blessed art thou, O king, who pardons and forgives our iniquities, who causes our transgressions to pass away forever. Thou king over all the earth, who hallows the Sabbath, thy people Israel, in the day of atonement. Remember unto us the covenant of the patriarchs. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember also my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land. Deal with us according to the promise in Scripture. When they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. Remember unto us the covenant with our ancestors, but I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, we not only think about what the Lord has done for us in the past, but we look forward uh, to what he is yet to do, not only for us, but our people Israel. Uh, as one day uh, he will come and establish his throne, not in Atlanta, Georgia, not in Washington, D.C., not in Greenville, South Carolina, in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. And we are certainly blessed with this building that he has uh, given to us, and we just trust that he will uh, use it for his purposes to impact uh, the local community, at least with our presence. Sometimes we just practice the presence. Sometimes just being there, we can minister to people. Sometimes we don't know what to say, but we can just let them know that we are there with them. That, uh, we will pray for them. We will encourage them. And uh, <clears throat> certainly things have been interesting these past couple of weeks. We really had opportunities to practice this. I'm sure you've had people call you to see how you were doing, and you probably called other people as well. And uh, along those lines, uh, we have an offering box in the social hall uh, that says hurricane uh, relief on it. And so uh, we are going to take up an offering, or maybe not take up, that's not the right word. We are providing an offering box so those who feel led uh, to support the Messianic congregations, uh, perhaps uh, in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, as well as uh, in Florida. I'll talk a little bit more even about uh, some of those uh, struggles that people have had that we have become aware of. Uh, <clears throat> not too dark up here. 
<laughs> I gotta be able to see. Those lights aren't working yet. All right. <clears throat> so two weeks ago, the remnants of Hurricane Helene passed right over Greenville, uh, causing us to postpone our very first service in this building. But did we let that stop us? No. no. We had our first service in the building last week following an 18-month renovation. Lots of hard work. Uh, and it was a glorious service uh, to experience what the Lord was doing uh, in, as this uh, new chapter in this ministry began. Deb Klein, uh, the second uh, praise song we sang was uh, a Deb Klein song, Purify Our, Our Hearts, uh, Purify Me, Lord. And uh, we actually had them here in person, uh, and we were blessed with their talents, making that service even more special. And during the storm, pretty much everyone in the area lost power, so we were unable to hold our Rosh Hashanah services, and that's the first time that has happened since we started meeting congregationally. While the Jewish people call the first day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar Rosh Hashanah, uh, literally the head of the year, the name of this day found in the scriptures is Yom Teruah which literally means the day of the loud blast, but is often translate, translated in the Messianic Jewish world as the Feast of Trumpets. And even though things were rough for many in our state, as I just said earlier, Western North Carolina had it much worse. And so our prayers uh, go out for these people. Some lost family members, some lost their homes, their entire homes. Some still do not yet have power and some may still even be struggling to find food and water. It's easy to complain about our circumstances, but it's also, uh, if we are willing, easy to look at others and realize that we can find blessing even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of the trial. Also, Hurricane Helene inflicted serious storm surge damage to Tampa Bay uh, and areas just to the north, uh, with Messianic Rabbi Stepakoff and his family experiencing six inches of water throughout their home. And in the past 48 hours, Hurricane Milton crossed central Florida with high winds and torrential rains, though most of the deaths from this storm will likely come from the tornadoes that touched down on the east side of the state before the eye had even come ashore. And as the storm seemed to be taking dead aim, at the Tampa area again, I was thinking about in this message, you know, we pray and we pray earnestly and we were praying for the storm. I certainly was because I'd been in contact with Rabbi Stepakoff and I was praying that there wouldn't be a second direct hit that might even have the storm, storm, uh, storm surge totally destroy his home uh, and that the storm would weaken and yet, as I was watching, that didn't seem to be what was happening. So the message was going to be what happens when we pray earnestly, when we believe, when we want it so bad, and yet it doesn't happen. However, in this case, at the last minute, the storm went a little bit to the south, and it weakened just before it hit land. And so I, all I can say is that was an answer to prayer. Praise the Lord. Uh, now, Rabbi Stepakoff is still struggling because they don't have power, and he needs the power uh, to be able to do what they need to do to deal with the water that came into the house uh, from Helene. Helene. But nonetheless, our God is a God who answers prayer. And I kind of thought to myself afterwards, you know, O ye of little faith. Uh, it wasn't looking good right up to the last minute, and I kind of chickened out and said, okay, let's work on the message of uh, what happens when we pray and it doesn't happen. But now I had to change the message because we prayed and it did happen. Um, <clears throat> but on top of the storms that have impacted Florida and the southeast, as I mentioned, our people in Israel have been going through a difficult time for the last year uh, with uh, recently launching this ground invasion against Hezbollah in Lebanon while continuing their fight against Hamas in Gaza. And while we would love to see peace between Israel and her neighbors, Israel has been eliminating the leadership of these two organizations, reducing their ability to execute an October 7th style of attack again, 
something that both groups have expressed a desire to do. And speaking of October 7th, this week I attended a one-year commemoration downtown where a small group, smaller than this group, of primarily Jewish people listened to someone who was at the music festival and others who were elsewhere in Israel when these events took place. And the commemoration was held at the Zen Center downtown, which meant that there were a few interesting statues right next to where I was sitting, not unlike that music festival in Israel. So we face many challenges, but we always seek to hold services if we can to enable us to come together as a community. Uh, <clears throat> many of the appointed times, the Moedim, sometimes referred to as the Jewish holidays, but the reality is the Lord calls the appointed times in Leviticus 23, Moedai in the Hebrew, my appointed times. And so uh, many of them have the instruction uh, to come together uh, for a sacred assembly, a mikra kodesh in the Hebrew, a holy convocation in some translations. In the New Covenant Scriptures, Hebrews 10 verse 25 tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some do, but exhorting one another. That's what's supposed to happen, uh, or at least one of the things that's supposed to happen when we come together for these assemblies that the Lord has instructed us uh, to hold weekly, the Sabbath, and at the seven other ta special times throughout the year, and one of them being this day, the Day of Atonement. So let us just go to the Lord in prayer as we um, thank Him for being in this building and ask Him to uh, just open our hearts to receive what He would reveal to us this evening. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, Lord, we acknowledge that we fall short of Your standard of righteousness. And Lord, all too often uh, that is made very uh, real to us as we see that we act selfishly, uh, that we hurt others. We'll even go through a list of the various offenses uh, in the Alchet later in the service. But Lord, uh, we just ask you to change us, Lord, to, to help us to see uh, where you would have us to change, to, to better be able to fulfill your calling on our lives. And so, uh, Lord, I just pray that eyes would be open to see ears would be open to hear, and hearts would be open to receive from you this evening. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 In Judaism, the Day of Atonement is observed primarily in the synagogue, starting with a kol nidre service, as we are doing here. And then there are services throughout the following day. And as our people contemplate their eternal destiny, the first thing our Jewish people do on this day is to refute vows that they may have been forced to make. A reminder that there have been times in our history when we have been forced to convert, either to Islam or to Christianity. In most synagogues, any dark fabrics in the sanctuary have been replaced with white. Often the leader and sometimes even the people will wear white as we do here. Like I said, at the previous synagogue I attended, what I refer to as the Eustagog, uh, we would wear the, the official uniform. And I was in the military, and the uniform of the day was, uh, th th there was a plan of the day which included what the uniform of the day was going to be. And thank goodness I never uh, remember showing up to anything when I was in the wrong uniform, but it would be a very difficult thing to have happen. Yet, my very first service uh, in this congregation, I showed up with my suit and my uh, Converse high top sneakers because you're not supposed to wear leather shoes because that's a sign of comfort. And this is all tied to tradition, uh, but the reality was I was the only one dressed like that. Everybody else was in white, and they were probably, most of them, wearing white sneakers uh, that were leather. Some of you probably didn't know that until now, so not to worry. Uh, but there is uh, this official uniform. But the reality is, that's what we look like on the outside. What's much more important 
is what do we look like on the inside? Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. He looks upon the inside. And so that's where we want to be clean before Him. That's where we ask Him to create in us a clean heart, to renew a right spirit within us, to restore unto us the joy of His salvation. Uh, <clears throat> we... Um, <clears throat> Uh, wearing white is also connected with the garments that the high priest wore on this day. And we uh, find that uh, it's also connected with Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, um, which says in the Jewish translation that uh, I had growing up, I don't always tell this story, but the reason I had it was my mother used to do the New York Times crossword puzzle every week, and a lot of the crossword puzzle clues were from the uh, old, what they call the Old Testament or the, the New Testament, and she bought this so she could do the Old Testament clues. She, was, she had to figure out the New Testament clues some other way because she wasn't about to buy a Bible that had the New Testament in it. Um, but in that, the translations that I have of the Hebrew Scriptures will be out of that particular translation, the Jewish Publication Society 1917 translation. Isaiah 118 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins uh, may be, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, uh, they shall be as wool. In Judaism, this service begins a 24-hour time of fasting. And that's based on the rabbi uh, interpretation of Leviticus 23, verse 27, which in, says that we are to afflict our souls. And uh, the rabbis have concluded that the primary way that we afflict our soul is through fasting. And that's based on a parallelism, uh, a uh, connection that we find in Isaiah chapter 58 that connects fasting with afflicting the soul uh, using this form of Hebrew poetry. There are other traditional prohibitions uh, on this day as well. Basically, we deny our concern for the outward as we focus on the inward. But as we examine this day further, we will see that it's much less about what we do and much more about what he has done. Today, Jewish people are told that their destiny in the Olam Haba, in the world to come, is determined on this day. And they are hoping, as they sit in the synagogue and as they go out through the doors, they are hoping that they will have been deemed good enough over the past year to have their names written in the Book of Life. And that's because our Jewish people and many in the church world as well have bought into an understanding that our eternal destiny hinges on our righteousness, our effort to be seen as righteous. Along these lines, the rabbis have concluded that on Rosh Hashanah, heavenly books are opened, and that there are some Jewish people who are sufficiently righteous that their name is immediately inscribed in the book of life. There are also some who are sufficiently evil to have their names immediately written in a book of death. Not that they're ever told who they are. But the rest, which is the vast majority of the Jewish people, have had the last 10 days, the days of all, the Yamin Noraim, to try to tip the balance in their favor through doing good works and giving to charity. And then on Yom Kippur, they fast and they pray, hoping that a favorable favorable verdict will be rendered as the books are closed and their fate is sealed should they die in the coming year. Now that's what they are told if they go to the synagogue. My family didn't even bother with any of that. But that's why it is uh, glorious to me that our righteousness is not based on what we do. Uh, because there, there are many, and the reality is all of us, who fall short of God's standard of righteousness. But that's where the greeting, Gamar Khatima Tova, meaning may you have a good final sealing, comes from. They fast and they pray, hoping that 
uh, a favorable verdict will be rendered as the books are closed and their fate is sealed. Judaism believes that the Gentiles' eternal fate is determined based on the Noahide laws, in case you were wondering, what God required of his creation before he established his covenant with Abraham. Now, in fairness, the Hebrew scriptures do mention books. In Psalm 69, verses 28 and 29, David says concerning his enemies, Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Daniel mentions a book in Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2, which says, I think we might even have these verses. <clears throat> Daniel 12, 1 and 2, we'll see if it comes up. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to reproaches and everlasting abhorrence. Here are the Hebrew scriptures describing two various possibilities for eternal destiny, uh, reproaches and everlasting abhorrence or eternal life. But what we don't find is where the, the, line, the dividing line is and who knows which side they're on. So we have this passage about a book and eternal destiny, but I've been unable to find anything in the Hebrew scriptures or the New Covenant scriptures to suggest that anyone can satisfy God's perfect standard of righteousness such that their names will be written in any book as a result of the good in their lives outweighing the bad. Because what we see in both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Covenant Scriptures is God provided the only way that anyone, Jew or Gentile, can be seen as righteous. The only way that we can uh, truly obtain atonement. The only way that we can have our name inscribed in the Book of Life. And that's through the blood sacrifice that Messiah Yeshua provided on our behalf. And we're going to look at a number of verses from the Hebrew Scriptures. Are we going to be able to put any of these up? Yes. Okay. Good. We'll see how we do. First one is Leviticus 17.11, uh, <clears throat> which says, For the life of the flesh. Now I'm reading from the traditional Jewish translation. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of the life. The Day of Atonement ritual is laid out in Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 16. And according to Leviticus 16, verse 8, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would draw lots uh, to determine which of two goats would be designated uh, one would be designated La Adonai, for the Lord, and the other one would be designated Azazel, the scapegoat. The goat designated La Adonai would be sacrificed to the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, as a sin offering, and the scapegoat, scapegoat would take on the sins of the people and was to be led away into the wilderness. Uh, a tradition later developed where they led him away into a boat, and that's why they called him a scapegoat. No, I misheard. <laughs> I was going to let that sit out there and say it if you laugh, but I decided that was dangerous and probably believe me. That, that's the danger of being a, a Messianic rabbi. Anyway, I want to talk about the Talmud, and we really don't refer specifically to the Talmud too often, but that is the fundamental document of Jewish tradition, and it describes an additional element that was added to the uh, Yom Kippur ceremony at some point. It says that a red strap would be tied to the temple door. And when the Lord had granted atonement to the nation, the strap would turn from red to white in accordance with Isaiah 118, which we talked about earlier. Now, <clears throat> there are two aspects to atonement. There's our individual standing before the Lord and our need for forgiveness. But there's also, as we see in what I just read, a community aspect. Uh, that the strap would either turn red or white depending on whether or not the Lord had accepted the atonement sacrifice uh, and granted the people atonement, meaning the entire nation, 
uh, as they went through the ritual of Leviticus 16. Can you imagine what seeing that sash, what looking at that sash, you know, you talk about a watch pot never boils. Can you imagine watching that sash to see, is it going to turn white? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, this is, this is real. There's a lot of theoretical approaches to the scripture. We spend hours sometimes discussing minutia. But the reality is our Jewish people would gather together as they were instructed, and they would look at that sash to see whether or not it turned white. And no matter how solemn the day, wouldn't you be ready to celebrate when that sash turned white? But what if the sash didn't turn white? Can you imagine how crushed you would feel? Probably something like watching the temple being destroyed a second time which caused our people to go from a temple-centered, sacrifice-centered faith to a synagogue-centered, Talmud-centered faith. And from that time forward, it was determined that atonement would come through man's efforts, through teshuvah, repentance, tefillah, prayer, and tzedakah, good works or giving to charity. This is essentially how our Jewish people respond to the question of why God allowed the temple to be destroyed if the blood sacrifices that could only be performed there were the only means of atonement. Now I should point out that many of our Messianic Jewish practices, the way we observe the Sabbath, uh, the way we observe the appointed times, are tied to rabbinic understanding. But there are also times when we feel like rabbinic traditions run counter to scriptural principles such as here, uh, where the means of obtaining atonement are different than the scriptures described. The scriptures required the blood sacrifice that we read earlier. Now, you may be wondering if Jewish writings talk about a time when that sash failed to turn from red to white, or talk about why God allowed the temple to be destroyed. And you're going to be surprised to find out that indeed they do. And once again, it's the Talmud that talks about these issues. And though not intentionally, I'm going to lay out an argument that what the Talmud says points to Yeshua as being the way of atonement. It's actually in a section of the Talmud, a tractate called Yomah, which means the day in Aramaic. Uh, and this is all about the most special day on the, uh, on the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur. And this section of the Talmud talks about three 40-year periods where signs connected to the Day of Atonement are talked about. The first 40-year period took place around 300 years before Yeshua lived. For those 40 years, it says, the sash always turned from red to white. That'd be like flipping heads 40 times in a row, I think I've done the calculation. It's one in a billions, uh, billions of uh, chances of that happening. 40 years in a row, the sash turned from red to white, and at the same time, so you gotta double your numbers, uh, <clears throat> or square them, I think. Uh, I'll let the math majors figure it out. Uh, the lot for lot and I turned up in the right hand. And then in the next 40 years, it says, um, sometimes the sash would turn from red to white, and other years, uh, it would not. And sometimes the lot would come up uh, in the right hand for lot and I, and sometimes it would come up in the left hand. And then there were another 40 years that are talked about, where <clears throat> the um, sash did not turn from red to white for 40 years in a row. And the lot for Lot and I came up in the left hand every time for 40 years in a row. And our Jewish people interpret uh, this, um, the, the way this has come about, these results, as a omen of the destruction of the temple. But it also suggests that whatever happened at that time uh, 40 years before the destruction of the temple is connected to the events on the Day of Atonement. The Talmud also tells us the reason for the destruction of the second temple 
uh, in 70 AD or CE. It says it took place as a result of sinat hinam, which means baseless hatred. Now, I'm going to suggest that there is one very significant event that took place 40 years before the destruction of the temple. Because it's clear that there was a drastic change in the life of our Jewish people starting at that point. Now, many scholars believe that Yeshua was crucified in the year 30 AD, which happens to be 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple. And that's concluding based on uh, a historical planetary alignment which could give the appearance of a star that would have stayed over him, as well as the timing of the death of Herod. So many scholars have concluded that Yeshua was born around 3 BC and died around 30 AD. Now to the Talmud saying that baseless hatred was the cause of the destruction of the temple. I would suggest that baseless hatred could well have been the execution of Yeshua. The New Covenant Scriptures tell us that the Jewish leaders sought the testimony of false witnesses. But according to Matthew 26, verses 60 and 61, two witnesses finally came forward, saying Yeshua said if the temple was destroyed, he would rebuild it in three days. And while they realized this was a messianic statement, they did not realize he was not talking about the destruction of the second temple. What was he talking about? What would happen after his death? When he was turned over to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, Pilate concludes that Yeshua committed no crime, saying in Luke 23, verse 3, I find no guilt in him. But as a result of the persistence of the chief priests and scribes, Pilate decides that he can find Yeshua guilty of claiming to be a king. As a result, he orders Yeshua's crucifixion based on a crime was, which was written on a sign displayed over his head in three different languages, according to John 19, verses 19 and 20. In Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, the sign said, Yeshua of Nazareth, King of the Jews. In terms of connection to atonement, we see his sacrifice as the fulfillment of the substitutionary death of the suffering servant mentioned in Isaiah 53, verse 8, which says he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. By the way, when I was in college, I was in the NROTC unit training to be a naval officer, as I eventually served five years as a submarine officer. But at one point in college, I asked another guy in the unit how he liked living with a guy that I referred to as a Jesus freak. But I didn't know the guy I was asking was one too. <laughs> in response, he showed me Isaiah 53, and I was blown away. I knew nothing of the prophecies concerning the suffering servant. And when I read it, I couldn't deny that it sounded like a description of Jesus from the little that I knew. But it didn't really matter because he was reading from a Christian Bible. And I was sure it would read drastically different in my Jewish Bible. Which I had because my mother did the crossword puzzles. And apparently she was on her own because I took it off to school 800 miles away. But that's a story for a different time. When I looked at it, it read exactly like he had read it out of the Christian Bible. It wasn't long after that, uh, with some subtle persuasion by my grandmother handing me a book called The Passover Plot, which suggested that Yeshua had orchestrated everything to make it look like he was the Messiah, I concluded it took more faith to believe that one man could orchestrate uh, what the Jewish authorities would do, what the Roman authorities would do, what his followers would do, than to believe these were prophecies given by the Jewish prophets about what would happen when Messiah came and that Yeshua, in fact, had fulfilled those prophecies. In Hebrews 7, verse 17, Yeshua is described as being a priest after the order of... Okay, I knew y'all were going to give me the Christian way of saying that. Malki Tzedek which means either my king is righteous or king of righteousness. So the Hebrew is very significant there. Psalm 110 verse 4 mentions this type of priesthood. As a priest, Hebrews 9.25 tells us Yeshua offered up himself 
not year by year as the regular Levitical high priest had to do, but as a once and for all time sacrifice. And according to the previous verse, Hebrews 9.24, his sacrifice was offered up in a different place. It was offered up in a tabernacle that was not man-made, not created by human hands. His sacrifice was offered up on the original heavenly tabernacle of which the earthly one was only a copy. His sacrifice is described as a better sacrifice in Hebrews 9 verses 13 and 14. And according to Hebrews 8 verse 6, it brings better promises. Now when it comes to accepting that God would sacrifice his son, our Jewish people struggle to see this as something that God would do. They struggle with the idea that God would ask uh, or expect human sacrifice to accomplish anything. But this is because even as partakers of the Abrahamic covenant, they do not understand that this type of covenant could be tested by either party to this type of covenant, which is called a covenant of strong friendship, a covenant that was executed at the time uh, that the Lord ex uh, established this covenant with Abraham. And the way this type of covenant was tested was either party could ask for the most prized possession of the other party. And uh, in the case uh, in Genesis 22, God asked Abraham to give him his most prized possession, the son of promise, the miracle child Isaac, to be sacrificed to the, on an altar to the Lord. And Abraham raises the knife to slay his son in demonstration of faithfulness to God and to the covenant. And God says, Abraham, I now know that you are a man of faith. And Abraham, you do not need to slay Isaac. And Abraham looks up and he sees a ram caught in the thicket. He says, I know you were willing to slay Isaac, but you can sacrifice the ram instead. But by testing the covenant in this way, God was also obligating himself to be willing to offer up his son as a sacrifice, which he demonstrates 2,000 years later in the sacrifice of his son, Yeshua, essentially ratifying the Abrahamic covenant in 30 AD. It is now in full effect. Many people believe the Abraham covenant is no longer in effect today, that it was for long ago in Abraham's time, maybe even Isaac and Jacob, but once the Mosaic Covenant came along, the Abrahamic Covenant is no longer meaningful. The reality is it wasn't even ratified until uh, less than 2,000 years ago. And it is definitely still in effect because God's promises in that covenant are eternal. Amen? Amen. Okay, just make sure you're still out there. <clears throat> We've already talked about the Talmud saying that Sinat Hinam, baseless hatred, was the reason the temple was destroyed. The Jewish people talk about the alternative to baseless hatred being ahavat hinam, baseless or unconditional is another way to say it, love. And interestingly, the key to the atonement that Yeshua provides is unconditional love. The love of God for the Jewish people, it's unconditional. The love of God for all of his creation is unconditional. The love of Yeshua for his Father and for us. And the command that we receive to be a blessing to others by loving them, not with the love of this world, which is a conditional love, which says, I will love you as long as you are fill in the blank. But we are to love with the same type of love that we have received. Unconditional love. In Yochanan, John 13, verses 34 and 35. Yeshua says, a new commandment I give to you. The commandment wasn't really new. What was new about it is the love that we were to have. It says that you love one another even as I have loved you. That's the new part. That you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's our calling. First and foremost is to demonstrate love one towards another. You better believe the adversary is going to make that difficult. You better believe that that's not going to be a lot easier said than done. But the reality is that's what we're called to do. It's not about keeping Torah. 
It's not about wearing the tzitzit. It's not about wearing the white outer clothes. It's about something every one of us can do. We can display a love that helps us to better understand the love that we received when Yeshua offered himself up as the sacrifice that is the only way any human being, Jew or Gentile, is able to come before the Lord and say, Lord, please grant me atonement. So tonight we've not only seen that the Talmud supports Yeshua being the ultimate sacrifice for atonement, but we've seen that his sacrifice fulfills the need of the Jewish people for the sacrifice that ratifies the Abrahamic covenant, the sacrifice that brings forgiveness for our sins, and the once and for all sacrifice that is the only way that anyone can experience atonement today. Now, this could be another way to understand what Yeshua said in Matthew 5, verse 17. He said, do not think that I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Many people misunderstand the concept of fulfillment. Some of them even think he's fulfilled everything. But the reality is we see in his life, and we may talk about this a little more tomorrow, We'll find out as I finish the message tonight, uh, because it's been a very interesting week. Um, our basement flooded from uh, Helene, and then we had the power outage, and we were finally able to get some folks over there to work on it. Uh, and so a lot of things have been happening, and this is true uh, in many of our lives. But we still know that God is on his throne in heaven, that one day he will rule from his throne on this earth, that even the enemies of the Jewish people will come uh, and worship him when he is ruling from his throne in Jerusalem. Otherwise, they'll have plague and no water. The reality is for those who choose to fast on this day, we have to remember that we're not fasting for righteousness and we're not seeking man's approval. In Isaiah 58, verse 5, the Lord condemns, condemns someone who is putting on a big show when fasting who bows low and spreads sackcloth and ashes under him. In Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18, Yeshua said something similar. He said, And whenever you fast, do not become sad-faced like the hypocrites, for they neglect their faces to make their fasting evident to men. Yes, I tell you, they have their reward in full. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting won't be evident to men, but to your Father who sees in secret, who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now fasting without looking miserable should be easier for us because we know that our eternal destiny is not based on our efforts to be good. Not that any of us understood that until the Lord supernaturally revealed that to us and we were able to see that uh, through our uh, ability to look at the scriptures and see the prophecies, see the fulfillment, see the role of the suffering servant, see the role of the blood sacrifice, and realizing that the only reason we are able to love him is because he first loved us. Now, uh, um, <clears throat> it's really a good thing that uh, our righteousness is not based on our efforts to be good, because Psalm 14 <clears throat> verse three says, there is none that is good or does good. No, not one, not even one. Isaiah 64, verse 5, Isaiah says our righteousness uh, is really like a polluted garment. Some translations say filthy rags. Um, so the concepts of repentance and prayer and charity that go along with this time, those are all good things. But the reality is the scriptures are clear that there is only one way that our names can be written in the book of life. And that requires a blood sacrifice that Yeshua provided, that all of the sacrificial system pointed to. Because the sacrificial system was an earthly system, but his sacrifice was offered up in the heavenly tabernacle. So right now we're going to play a song by Marty Getz called The Love of God. And I just want everyone to listen to the words of this song and contemplate uh, what they mean to you. Oh, 
people talk a great deal about sin during the High Holy Days. Many of the prayers are about acknowledging our sinfulness, that we fall short of the standard of a righteous and holy God. We'll actually be saying some of those prayers in just a moment. But that song we just heard tells us how we really obtain forgiveness for our sins, how we truly experience the love of God. And it's only by accepting the sacrifice that Yeshua made According to Hebrews 7, verse 27, he acted as both a high priest and the offering as he offered up himself to bring about the promise of the new covenant that Jeremiah described to our Jewish people. Uh, the Jewish prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, verses 30 through 34. In Jeremiah 31, 31, this covenant uh, with the Jewish people called the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Uh, in this passage, this new covenant will result in the blessing described in Jeremiah 31, verse 34, where the Lord says through Jeremiah, For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. That's the promise of the new covenant to the Jewish people. So I'd like to pr everybody to pray right now with heads bowed and eyes closed. For any who are not sure that their sins are forgiven, uh, I would just ask the Lord to speak to you by His Spirit right now, and let you know that you can walk out those doors knowing that your sins have been forgiven. And all you have to do is accept the sin sacrifice that Yeshua provided on your behalf. You can even picture in your mind right now that red strap turning white as God grants you that atonement. So still with heads bowed and eyes closed, if there's anyone who has not accepted Yeshua as your Messiah before, but you now realize that you need the atoning blood that he shed on your behalf to have your sins forgiven. All you need to do is raise your hand to say yes to receiving him, and you put it right back down. Is there anyone? Last week we had two people raise their hands uh, and come forward, and we rejoice uh, whenever uh, someone else experiences what many of us have experienced. And we certainly know from these storms that no one is even guaranteed their next breath, uh, that, that uh, things can happen in this world. And so um, we give the opportunity because this may be the exact moment that the Lord has ordained uh, for you to experience the salvation that only He can provide. Is there anyone? Now I want to talk to those of us who have accepted Messiah Yeshua and acknowledged Him as our high priest, as the one who offered himself up as the sacrifice for our sins, as the one who willingly laid down his life because of his love for his heavenly Father and his love for each one of us to agree with me in this prayer. As Lord, we thank you for forgiving us of our sins, and we ask you to help us to forgive those that have hurt us and to be willing to ask forgiveness for those we have hurt. And we ask that you would reveal to us how may we may have wronged our fellow men or our spouses or other family members or friends or whoever it might be, Lord, as uh, we just ask you to help us to humble ourselves, to ask for forgiveness, and to make things right in our relationships. As Lord, we thank you for this day that you have instructed us to afflict our souls to look inward and find what may be keeping us from serving you in the way that you desire. Lord, I pray that we would just continue to strive to walk closer to you, to be more conformed to the image of your Son, and to do a better job of demonstrating unconditional love one to another. 
Lord, we pray for our Jewish brethren and synagogues around the world who desire your forgiveness, that they would come to understand that forgiveness is not based on human effort. Thankfully, we say that. But the reality is, uh, it, though it lifts a burden off our shoulders, it, it takes a step of faith to acknowledge Messiah's atoning sacrifice on our behalf. As Lord, we humbly desire to serve you on this day in accordance with your will, that you might receive all the glory, honor, and praise. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. And everyone say, Amen and Amen. Remember, um, we'll have our closing service tomorrow at 4 p.m., and we'll be talking uh, primarily about scriptural aspects of the day that we did not discuss this evening. Tomorrow's service will have a number of chants uh, that are in Hebrew for prayers that we regularly say during our Torah service on Friday night, but we only say them in English. Uh, <clears throat> now I'm going to call up Randall Anderson. Uh, as we continue our service with the al -Khan. Please stand for the al -Khan. O Lord our God and God of our fathers, forgive all our sins, pardon all our iniquities, and grant atonement for all our transgressions, together <clears throat> for the sin which we have committed in your sight without intention, and for the sin which we have committed before you by sowing discord, for the sin which we have committed in your sight by evil thoughts, and for the sin which we have committed before you by offensive speech, for the sin which we have committed in your sight through dishonesty, and for the sin which we have committed before you through wrongdoing. For all of these, O oh God, forgive us, forgive us, pardon us, grant us atonement. For the sin which we have committed in your sight through selfishness, and for the sin which we have committed before you by pride, for the sins requiring a burnt offering, and for the sins requiring a sin offering, for the sins requiring burying offerings, and for the sins requiring guilt offerings, for the sins requiring corporal punishment, and for the sins requiring forty lashes, for the sins requiring premature death, and for the sins requiring excommunication. For all of these, O oh God of forgiveness, forgive us, pardon us, grant us atonement. Y'all may be seated. For as we read of the Messiah, he was wounded because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, did go astray. We turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath made to lie on him the iniquity of the soul. In the past, God provided atonement for us through the sacrificial system. So we read, Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the ark cover and in front of the ark cover. And he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. For the life of the flesh 
is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your sins. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Now, he provides that atonement through Yeshua, our Messiah, as the book of Hebrews explains to us. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serving the living God. But he had been offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time on until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Now call Rabbi Ed. Please stand for the affirmation of faith. Let us now say together one time. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. And now three times. Baruch Shem Kippo, Malchuto Re'olam Ba'ed. Baruch Shem Kippo, Malchuto Re'olam Ba'ed. Baruch Shem Kippo, Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed. And now seven times. Adonai Hu Ha Elohim. 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 And now the English translation, one time. Go ahead, next slide. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. The Lord, He is God. 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 Now I'm going to call our cantor back up once again as we are going to pronounce the blessing that's found in Numbers chapter 6. These are words that the Lord instructed Moshe to have Moses to have his brother Aharon, Aaron, uh, as the first Kohen Gadol, as the first high priest, to pronounce these words of blessing from the Lord over the people. We encourage you to stand and receive these words from the Lord this evening. Yevarechecha Adonai Vayishmarecha Yaher Adonai Panav Alecha Vechunecha Yesar Adonai Panav Alecha Yesenuecha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord calls His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and may He grant unto you His peace. Amen. Thank you.
thank you all for attending our service. We pray that you were blessed by the Lord this evening and will come back and worship with us again tomorrow. If you're unable to, just a reminder uh, that this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. we'll be putting up our sukkah, but we hope that you'll be able to join us tomorrow for our closing service as well as the break the fast afterwards. Once again, Shabbat Shalom and good job.